I'm very, very honored tonight to introduce someone who has is receiving tonight the Lifetime Achievement Award. This award began in the year 2000, and we, you have a lot of good company tonight, the recipient does. Um, I won't go through the whole list of names, but it is a, a real honor, and it recognizes those in our association, or those who are alumni, really, who have uh, achieved quite a lot in their careers and also shown some of the Fulbright spirit uh, in efforts toward mutual understanding. Our honoree for tonight is David Bradley, as you may have heard earlier. And I'll ask him to come up in a few minutes, but first let me say a few words. Mr. Bradley is chairman of Atlantic Media, as many of you in this room know. You recognize the Ad Atlantic magazine. Uh, but the holdings also include Quartz, National Group, and Government Executive Media Group. At the age of 26, he launched his first company, the Advisory Board Company, a for-profit think tank ultimately serving 4,000 corporations, financial institutions, and medical centers, not only in the U.S., but around the world. The advisory board company and its sister enterprise, the Corporate Executive Board, today are public companies listed on NASDAQ. Earlier in his 20s, Mr. Bradley was a Fulbright Scholar in the Philippines. I want to take a moment to just say that he and his wife are both still involved in a foundation that they began in the Philippines, and this foundation serves as an emergency um, medical. medical facility for abused children. David Bradley graduated from Swarthmore College holds an MBA from Harvard Business School, a JD from Georgetown University, and more recently an honorary doctorate of letters from Swarthmore. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and board memberships include the Council on Foreign Relations, General Assembly, is it KIPP DC, right? And New America Foundation. He is based here in Washington DC, and he has a large group of his family with him, and we're so pleased that they've joined us tonight. Mr. Bradley, we welcome you to address the Fulbright Association. Good evening. <laughs> thank you, Nancy. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you for those who, uh, who selected me for this honor. I'm delighted, delighted to have it. Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, my career is like everything else in life. To know it better is to hold it in less regard. Um, <laughs> after dinner remarks are um, they're not really a highly anticipated genre of, of entertainment. Um, but a friend of mine saw me taking out my notes <clears throat> for some kind of uh, inconsequential remarks, and he said, ah, I see a flood of light is about to be cast, where heretofore there was no darkness. <laughs> May I ask how many of you are from the Washington area? <laughs> okay, well, some of you will know the McDonald's at Venice Street and Wisconsin Avenue. Um, uh, it used to be a Roy Rogers, and for as long as I can remember, when I'm doing hard work, I like to have a lot of white noise around me. So I used to go to this McDonald's when it was a Roy Rogers, and I'd go for hours a day, maybe four days a week or so, spread out everything. You avoid making eye contact with the regulars, because you're not there for social purposes, but you, you're aware of them the whole time. 
And every morning around 10 o'clock, about a dozen men would come in. They were all men. They were all in their late 60s or their 70s. Um, they were taxi drivers. And they would come in one by one. They'd sit in the same area, rarely at the same table, but they'd shout out to each other for about an hour. Um, and the basis of all the conversation was the newspaper. So they'd all be reading the Washington Post, and they would be commenting. And every person they commented on was an idiot. Um, so <clears throat> Steve Case was in the news a lot. He had uh, the founder of AOL, and they'd say, have you read the article about Steve Case yet? You and that idiot, is he in again? Where is he, what page? That guy's an idiot. And just this constant background harmony of, of people who are idiots. So the day after I bought the Atlantic from Mort Zuckerman, the Washington Post style section had a, an article on the acquisition. And I was sitting there in Roy Rogers and the conversation began. And it was just, it's exactly what you think. Really? No, I don't think so. Yes, it's that one. No, it can't be. You mean that guy there? Long pause. Well, he's an idiot. <laughs> My academic advisor in graduate school told me that the point of the Fulbright Scholarship is through your research to produce some small gain in the sum of human knowledge. And in the event I followed her admonition, I can't tell you how small a gain in human knowledge I produced. <laughs> but I made a friend. On arrival in the Philippines, age 24, I was taken to a 100-year-old Spanish-era mansion on the Pasig River. Uh, by its state of disrepair, you could tell that uh, it had once been grand, uh, but it was in hard times. And the landlady was a woman I took to be just ancient. She was 65 years old. Um, and she never charged any of us rent, but she wouldn't object if on a roughly monthly basis you left some sum of money on her bureau to help support the household. We were uh, to call her Tita Jessie. The ups and downs of this dear woman's life were like nothing I had ever seen in my own sheltered East Coast um, childhood. She was born to parents in a little island called the Isle of Pines, which used to be part of the United States. It's now been uh, returned to Cuba. She was orphaned at age 10, and then she was raised by the nuns. She went up to Boston for secretarial school, and you see the first rise in her life. She met the first Filipino at Harvard Law School and he proposed marriage. And having no real basis for life here, she said yes. And she boarded passage uh, for a ship, this is in the 1920s, to the Philippines, never having been out of the country. She made one friend on that boat, a woman named Jean. It was Jean MacArthur, who was Douglas MacArthur's wife. And for an hour in the sunshine years of their lives, uh, Tita Jesse and her brilliant husband and Douglas and Jean MacArthur and the High Society of Manila um, spent those flush years of the 20s together. Um, she had, uh, had a family, um, but in 1942, the arc of her life goes the other direction. She didn't get out of Manila in time uh, when the Japanese arrived, so she spent the entirety of the war, 42 to 1945, often hungry, always in hiding. After liberation of the Philippines, her husband's legal career took off again, and he was appointed to be the ambassador of the Court of St. James uh, in England. So there was a chapter where she was the sort of first lady of the Philippines in London society. Uh, but then, a few years before I met her, her children had left the house, her husband died suddenly, and the money ran out. And now, <clears throat> uh, uh, she had living alone, taken in, in this cavernous house, taken in two Fulbrights whose stipends help the household get by. I want to use the ups and downs of Tita Jessie's life uh, throughout for the through line of these remarks. What I think of as the sine curve of life. Uh, the Atlantic ran a cover story a few years ago uh, on the Harvard happiness story. Um, I assume all of you you read it, um, but there's no point in trying to go back through your minds. And, <clears throat> um, you're, you're a slightly young demographic for our readership in any event, so um, <clears throat> let me explain it to you. 
In the late 1930s, the dime store magnate W.T. Grant gave Harvard uh, a sum of money to do a battery of physical exams and then eight psychological exams on 268 Harvard uh, students, all men in those years, from the classes of 1941, 42, and 43. Uh, they were really elaborate tests, strong physical exam, um, mental, uh, the psychological exam, and then he, uh, he paid for social workers to come and interview the friends uh, and the roommates of these Harvard students, and even to go back to their hometowns and interview their families. It would be what we would call today a really elaborate 360. Now what's remarkable about this is Harvard found the study to continue looking at this same cohort of 268 people once every five years to this day. Most of the men are now deceased. The, those who are alive are in their 90s. Um, but Harvard knows everything about those people. Um, so they can do something very interesting. They can see who turned out in his 70s and 80s to be both happy and healthy. That's the win-win box in life, to be happy, happy and healthy. Then they could go back through 70 years of clinical, psychological, and narrative data to see, well, what are the predictors of health and happiness later in life? What happens early in life that predicts how you will come out at the end? They found three factors. Uh, it's too long to do all three, uh, but let me do one. <clears throat> it's the principle that they call adaptivity. The Harvard researchers focused acutely on how the individual subjects responded to setbacks and disappointments. Tracking these boys from college to death, the researchers knew every bad turn, every failed romance, every failed marriage, the death of a child, career stumbles, bankruptcies, anything that went wrong at all. And then they studied how did they respond to those disappointments. They created a frame of four categories of disappointment, from the worst way to handle disappointment to the best way. So at the low end, the worst kind of handling of a disappointment is bitterness, hardness, denial, paranoia, withdrawal. At the high end, the healthiest response to a setback is humor, bemusement, self-deprecation, a sense of letting go and moving on. It seems too particular to be true, uh, but how you respond to setback is one of the three strongest predictors Harvard University found to being healthy and happy later in life. And the most remarkable finding of the Harvard study, every one of the 268 students suffered setback. Nobody, nobody made it through life without setback. So we've reached the heart of what I want to say. Um, that is my frame, that life is the sine curve. Do you remember trigonometry? The line goes up and you know. How many of you are in the humanities? <laughs> Apparently there's something, who knows, nobody's ever seen it, that's like a, a wave that goes on and on and they cutely named it a sine curve. That's what life is. You're up, you're down, you're up, you're down, you're up, you're down, forever. It never stops. The only thing you can know at the bottom of the curve is you're coming back up. And the only thing you can know at the top of the curve is you're coming down. <laughs> but the top of the curve and the bottom of the curve are very different places. And they need a very different response. So at the top of the curve, what you want to have is a sense of modesty, impersonalization of the success. You want those sets of attributes that you would deploy if you knew you were about to come down. But the bottom of the curve is really hard. There will be moments in everyone's life um, when the wind is just taken from your sails, a marriage that goes wrong, some great sadness for a child, a career that levels off below the station that you had thought it would get to. There are existential lows. Is this it? Is this, is this the whole of it? I have a friend who says, life just breaks your heart. The central lesson for the bottom of the curve is not to derail. This is no time to radically rethink your life. It's no time for big decisions. You don't quit your job, quit your marriage, move to Vermont, start a B&B. &B. You don't abandon your children, take up with a lover in Tahiti. Let's just do that real quickly. How many of you took up with lovers in Tahiti? 
Let's get to the real Fulbright stories. At the bottom, the temptation is to try to escape the hard hour by escaping the circumstance. And it just never works. There is no escaping the hard hour. So how do you get through it? Well, the field of pain management offers an insight here. And what they tell you if you're suffering chronic pain is, if you say, I can't, I can't do this the rest of my life, they say, well, shorten the time horizon. Can you do it for a year? And if the answer is no, I can't, well, can you do it today? Or can you do it the next five minutes? You bring in your time horizon to the amount of time you can deal with, and then within that time, you do your duty. You do the thing you're supposed to do that day, dutiful day after dutiful day, until the curve turns. So if I may, I want to return to that old woman getting by on Fulbright stipends in her aging mansion in Manila. In my life, no one has traveled a more dramatic sine curve of ups and downs than Tita Jesse, and no one has endured it with better grace and humor. Next week, I guess no, nine days from now, I'm going to make my annual trip back to Manila to see my old friends from my mid-20s. And while there, I will go by the old house to have dinner with my old friend, Tita Jesse, who is 105 years old, and she is just delighted about it. My admiration for Tita Jesse mirrors my larger admiration for the Fulbright program. The Fulbright program launched in 1949 in a less complex um, and more optimistic time is the US government's purest form of diplomacy. There's no condition on military alliance, on trade agreements, on extradition treaties, on cooperation with the DEA or the NSA or the CIA. In the language of the founding legislation, it is done only for mutual understanding. So save for the fact that I personally proved the least accomplished scholar, this is American diplomacy at its best. Thank you. Well, you've caused me to have some second thoughts. You know, I was thinking we were sort of getting to the top of our game at the Fulbright Association, but I'm thinking, that's not a good place to be. Let's just, let's just assume we're down here somewhere. <laughs> Thank you so much for your wonderful address and for being the, a role model for the kind of person we'd all like to be and all the achievements we'd like to have and for the understanding you bring to us that nobody lives up here all the time. That's a little bit of a consolation too, right? Um, tonight I want to present to you a plate that has been made for you by someone in Maryland, an artist in Maryland. We'll have the name of the artist on the packaging and we promise to deliver this so you don't have to take it home with you tonight. Uh, so let me present David Bradley with the 2017 Lifetime Achievement Award. 